Welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online at rce-cast.com, and we're coming up very, very close on episode 100. Once again, I have Jeff Squire from Cisco Systems and one of the authors of OpenMPI. Jeff, thanks a lot for your time. Hey, Brock. Yeah, today we're actually, this is actually fairly timely because uh, the, the HPC community was just kind of rocked in a little turmoil with that uh, certain little blog post from Mr. Jonathan Dursey about uh, how HPC is dying and MPI is killing it. And one of the big things that he cited in there as, as a comparison point was that the big data community seems to be growing much faster than the HPC community. Um, and uh, it's actually just completely coincidental that we're actually interviewing somebody from that community today. Yeah, so one of the things he referred to was uh, Spark, and Spark's something I've been screwing around with and having a lot of fun with, but one of the things Jonathan pointed out was that you're able to still write, he actually wrote Diffusion using Spark and much less space than it takes to use MPI, and he had job posting and other stuff, and so that, that was really interesting, and I thought a lot of it was because people just don't know these things exist, which is part of the reason you and I do this. And I wrote about that at Failure as a Service, um, which is my blog. And, you know, basically I think people need to learn about these things. So I gave it away. We're talking about Spark today. So let's go right in. Uh, right. Yeah. Matei, take a moment to introduce yourself. Um, hi. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I'm uh, Matei Zaharia. Um, I'm an assistant uh, professor at MIT uh, working in distributed systems. And uh, I started the Spark project while I was a grad student uh, before that. And uh, I also spent uh, the past two years uh, commercializing it through this company called Databricks. So I wonder if could you give us the the quick run out? What is Spark? Give us the you know the quick answer and then we'll dive into more specifics. Yeah, sure. So Spark is a parallel uh, computing framework for data processing on clusters. Uh, it uh, lets you use uh, some concise APIs in Python, Java, or Scala to process data at scale. So people are probably most familiar with the MapReduce paper, which is actually quite old now. And, you know, the big data um, analytics community really kind of got running when MapReduce kind of got brought to everyone's mind. How is this different than MapReduce? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so Spark is actually uh, inspired by MapReduce, and uh, it tries to uh, generalize uh, the MapReduce programming model so that you can capture more types of algorithms or of computations, but still keep uh, the nice properties of MapReduce, uh, such as fault tolerance and automatic distribution uh, and placement of computation near the data. Um, so it started, our research group was actually doing research on MapReduce, and as we saw people trying trying to use that for new applications. We designed this new model. So um, Hadoop is known as, you know, kind of the, the front runner in terms of a MapReduce framework that's out there right now. But Hadoop offers a lot of things. Does Spark replace everything about Hadoop? Um, it, it, yeah, good questions. Um, so Spark, Spark does not um, uh, try to replace everything in Hadoop. Uh, the part it, uh, it replaces, or you know, the part you can use it for, is uh, the distributed processing part, which is what MapReduce would do. Um, but uh, the Hadoop stack also contains a lot of other projects. It contains storage systems, such as the Hadoop file system, and Spark can use those, but it's agnostic to those. It doesn't uh, try to provide its own file system or anything like that. And likewise, all the key value stores and um, uh, things like that that are in the Hadoop stack don't get replaced. Um, so Spark is used most often uh, in Hadoop environments alongside the other components of the Hadoop stack. So what then is the value of Spark? So if I'm using it inside Hadoop, and at least to me, a, a novice in, in the big data kind of world, why wouldn't I just use pure Hadoop, all the things that come with Hadoop that allow me to do MapReduce and, and the like? Yeah, good Yeah, good question. So, so the main part is that um, the, the Spark execution engine lets you do more types of computation and um, often faster or more easily, uh, easier to program than you would using MapReduce. Um, so there's kind of uh, two pieces of that. Uh, one is that the engine is designed to be um, highly general, so it can do not 
just batch computations like MapReduce, but also uh, streaming computations or interactive queries where you're sitting at a console and uh, typing in queries and getting answers. Um, so basically, it's this wide range of things. Um, and then the uh, APIs for it are quite a bit easier to, uh, to program with than the MapReduce API. So it's these um, uh, high-level um, functional programming-based uh, APIs in uh, Python and Java and Scala. And many of the things that you'd have to write custom MapReduce code for uh, in, in uh, Hadoop, uh, there's already a library function to do it in Spark. So it's just faster to put together programs. So does Spark itself utilize any of the MapReduce algorithms, or is it pretty much taking what you saw a lot of people doing with MapReduce and worked with it? Uh, it it um, it utilizes the uh, some of the ideas that were in the MapReduce um, you know architecture or design. So, for example, ideas like uh, sending computations to the nodes that contain the data, and um, you know figuring out tracking enough about the computation to figure out how to recover from failure. Uh, but it doesn't use the code in Hadoop MapReduce. The only part of um, Hadoop it interacts with is the storage systems, and it can use the the same interfaces that um, everything else in Hadoop uses to read from any Hadoop-supported uh, storage system. So now when you say that Spark is faster, um, how does it get that speed up? Um... Yeah, good question. So uh, there's two main things that contribute. Um, one of them is that um, Spark can uh, Spark lets you um, uh, control and use uh, distributed memory in your program. So if you have a bunch of machines, you can choose to load data sets into memory across of them, uh, keep them there across queries. And if you have any kind of iterative algorithm or any kind of uh, interactive queries where you're um, asking multiple questions, Ways on the same data set at once, uh, that part is quite a bit faster. Uh, in, in traditional MapReduce, you don't have any uh, control over memory. You can't have like a variable that uh, you load into memory and then you uh, share across MapReduce steps. Um, so this is the first thing. Uh, and then the second thing is that the engine um, also supports more general sort of computation graphs. Uh, so if you look at MapReduce, it's just these two phases, map and reduce. And if if you have an algorithm that needs to do more phases of communication, for example, you have to run it as separate MapReduce jobs. And there's quite a bit of overhead to starting each job and feeding data from one of them into the next one because it has to go uh, into a file. And uh, with Spark, you can have a more general graph with multiple stages. And this also uh, helps improve performance, even if you're not using the in-memory um, uh, features at all. So that's uh, an interesting point you raised right there. One of the big performance criticisms of typical MapReduce slash Hadoop uh, and all of its clones is that it has to read and write to files all the time. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of reasons why it was architected that way. But uh, am I reading between the lines of your answer here that you don't? do that or you don't have to do that in Spark? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we can avoid that in a lot of cases. Um, and in particular, in MapReduce, the part that's really um, slow, really time consuming is the output of each MapReduce job has to go into a file in a distributed file system. So it actually has to be replicated across nodes for fault tolerance, and it's very expensive to do that right. And then you do that, and then immediately you just read it into another Hadoop job. Um, so in Spark, if you just uh, merge those jobs together into one uh, execution graph, you can avoid all of that. So Spark tries to do a lot of this stuff in memory, but do I have to do anything special if, uh, say, the data set I'm working with is, is larger than the piece of memory? Do I kind of have to manually manage this in memory, out of memory? Yeah, the way it's designed, you don't uh, have to do that. So uh, it will... Um, gracefully uh, sort of spill out to use the disk if it can't fit things into memory. Um, of course, if you want, you can try to manage it. Uh, you can try to tell it, well, you know, you loaded a data set and you want to remove it, um, uh, and so on. Uh, but even if the data sets don't fit, the idea is that you shouldn't have to uh, change your program based on the size of the cluster you're running on and how many resources there are. Um, and this is also helpful, actually, if machines fail in the middle of your program or if you your job needs to be resized down because you want to launch another job or stuff like that. 
Okay, now that's an interesting point right there too. So how, what level of abstraction do you provide? So you, you mentioned mm -hmm. at the very beginning that you have library calls for common operations above just the raw underlying uh, message passing and, and whatever yes. Um, yes. Uh, loading of data and things like that. And so assumedly those are indicated for or are targeted at specific types of tasks that and use cases that, that you have created. Is the fault tolerance baked into that? So if you say, hey, solve, you know, for X and halfway through half of the nodes die, you know, what, what level of fault tolerance do you have? Will it restart the computation or, mm -hmm. or, or how does that go? Yeah, good question. Yeah, so let me let me explain that uh, in a bit of detail. So um, the way the programming model works is you work with these uh, distributed collections, uh, uh, these distributed data sets, and um, it's uh, maybe in in some ways you can compare it to uh, some of the array uh, programming languages for HPC where you had distributed arrays. So you build a data set, uh, you know, it's spread out across multiple machines, and it contains objects of any type. So for example, say Java objects, if you're uh, doing things in Java. And then you have um, operations on top of these data sets. For example, you can do a map that gives you back a new data set, uh, or you can do a group by, or a filter, or something um, of that nature. And um, Spark um, uh, makes sure that if you use these operations, it can always recover, uh, you know, the result of any sequence of operations. So uh, each data set is, you know, can always be recomputed uh, because Spark tracks the operations that you use to build it. And if you lose only a fraction of a data set, like say you started with something and you did a map and then you lost, you know, one of the results, it can also do the recomputation on only the part that was missing and rebuild just that part and not have to roll everything back uh, to a check point or like redo the whole computation. So it, uh, it tries to provide this uh, fine-grained fault recovery where you only recover the pieces that are missing. And uh, all the abstractions are set up so basically everything has uh, this kind of fault tolerance uh, from out of the box. You'd have to go and do something special if you didn't want to have this. But all the operations uh, provide this already. So you, you kind of touched on it there, but these are the RDDs. Uh, yes. can, can you give a little bit more, like tell what RDD stands because everything's based around that. And then also tell about some of their characteristics such that gives you the parallel performance, the constraints you put mm -hmm. into place, but gives it the performance. Right, yeah, yeah. So these distributed data sets uh, you, worked with, uh, you work with um, are called RDDs or resilient distributed data sets. And um, basically, there, there are a few uh, interesting things with them. So they're... Um they can contain sort of arbitrary types of objects, as I said, so like Java objects, for example, if you're programming in Java, and each RDD is uh, spread out across the nodes uh, of your cluster, so it can be partitioned in, in sort of any way. And um, RDDs are um, uh, immutable, so once you create one, you can't modify it. You just create new ones from it, uh, and this is what allows us to sort of track exactly how it was built. And basically what happens is you start by um, creating an RDD, for instance, by referring to a file in your file system. You can say, okay, like view that as a collection of uh, strings, uh, you know, for example. Uh, and then you do transformations on it, such as a map, and Spark tracks the, the graph of operations that you use to build a specific RDD, which is called its lineage. And then it can use that to recompute uh, any um, partition of the RDD uh, um, at any time. Um, so you work by just defining these and, and chaining together these transformations to create new data sets. And then once you've built them, uh, Spark figures out a way to execute them on the cluster. Um, it's very similar to um, working with uh, collections uh, in a functional language. So actually, uh, it came from the, um, uh, you know, from looking at the Scala um, programming language, like at its collection library. And it's also similar to the various um, uh, functional APIs in Python, like the iterator tools and so on. Okay, so you said something in there, like, you know, they're immutable, you basically are just transforming it and making new RDDs and you can kind of build them up. Is there any type of like optimizer where it'll kind of look at all your transformations before it actually starts moving the data and kind of limits data movement? 
Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. There are, there are several things that are done here. And actually, this is one of the areas where we're trying to uh, extend the API to enable even more uh, optimizations. Um, so uh, uh, a couple of things that are done. So one is with regard to data partitioning, you can ask Spark to partition a data set in a given way. Um, so for example, if you have key value pairs, like say the key is, um, I don't know, it's like a URL for a web page and the value is the content of the web page, you can do something like, say, partition them by domain name. So then pages, you know, from the same domain name are on the same machine, and, and you can do things with them um, faster that way. Um, and then many of Spark's um, operations that you run on these are aware of the partitioning and try to take advantage of it. So if you have a data set that's already grouped, for instance, here by domain name, uh, and you want to uh, do a reduce operation on it, uh, it knows that, you know, these pages are already on the same machine, so it can avoid some communication. Or if you have two data sets uh, that you want to join, uh, which means bringing together elements um, with the same key from, from the two data sets, it also looks at how they're partitioned and tries to figure out the way that will minimize communication. Um, and then the other optimization uh, that it does, which is helpful, is pipelining things. So for example, if you do a map function and then you do another map function, you know, and the result of that, uh, it fuses these together into a single function, and then uh, it applies both of them at once. So you don't have to, you know, read the data once, you know, do the first thing and, and, and save it somewhere, and then start reading it again. You can do both of them in, in one scan. Um, so these things help, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the reason they're nice is because when you write a program, you can structure your program in terms of these small, simple operations like map, and then at the end of the day, you still get an execution plan that's, uh, you know, that's pretty good, even though you got this, this really modular program that, that you used to build it. Now, let me ask a little more about these optimizations, because you, you mentioned some very interesting ones there about trying to minimize communication, because obviously this is one of your limiting steps is, is shuttling all the data around. Yep. And mm -hmm. as the name implies, big data, you know, it just takes mm -hmm. time to send stuff across networks, and it also consumes resources and all these kinds of things that could be used for computing. So uh, do you have other types of optimizations, or are you looking at things like network topology awareness and even – uh, so outside the box, right? Network topology things like staying on a leaf switch rather than going through a, a core switch and things like that and, and mm -hmm. other types of, of optimization inside the box. So for NUMA awareness and, and mm -hmm. uh, stuff like that. Yeah, definitely. There's a bunch of in, of, um, of uh, stuff in there already, and there's a bunch of new uh, stuff uh, uh, going on as well. Um, so in terms of network topology, uh, for input, actually, both for input data and for data that you save uh, into memory, uh, Spark is aware of the network topology, and you can do stuff like you can specify, you know, um, which machines are in the same rack and be aware of the rack topology as well. So it, it understands that there's this um, hierarchical uh, like tree, uh, tree topology. So when it's reading input data from something like the Hadoop file system, it knows which machines have each block of data. And same thing when, when you cache data in memory, it, it tries to place computations you know, as close as possible uh, to the machines that have it. Um, we've also um, tried to optimize some of the specific uh, you know, communication operations. So for example, one uh, that... Uh, we spent a bunch of time on is doing um, broadcast. And we tend to run in these uh, sort of uh, Ethernet uh, commodity networks, which don't have any special built-in uh, primitives for these. Um, so we, we do actually, for broadcast, we have this um, implementation of BitTorrent, more or less, that the nodes can use to send data around. And that's, uh, that's pretty important in uh, some applications that tend to broadcast a large uh, sort of parameter vector to everyone. So apart from uh, this networking um, stuff, the, the other area where there's active work so apart from uh, this networking stuff, uh, there's also uh, uh, some interesting work going on with uh, doing relational optimizations in Spark. So these are the same kinds of optimizations uh, that you do in databases, and they're things you can do when you have a more structured model for the data. So for example, you have a table of records, and you know that each record has, say, an integer field and a float field. And then the database community has done a lot of work 
work and uh, storing and querying these efficiently, um, you, you know, including things like column-oriented databases and uh, doing processing directly on compressed data and so on. So in Spark, we have a project uh, called Spark SQL, which lets you uh, store data with a known schema and then query it using SQL. And we also have an API called uh, Data Frames, which is similar to the data frames in uh, the R programming language and the pandas in Python, you know, if you've ever looked at these um, Python data processing libraries, and data frames, uh, you know, let you have a, a, a distributed table with a, uh, you know, with a known schema and uh, do these kinds of uh, relational operations on it from inside a, a normal programming language like Python. And we optimize these operations then using these uh, techniques. And you can get actually quite a bit uh, better performance even than with the uh, plain uh, Spark. APIs. Okay, so that's uh, yet another interesting point. I feel like I've been saying that the whole interview here. Um, so you're talking about making optimizations because you can know the structure of things, which kind of flies in the face of what one of the perceived values of these kinds of systems is, which is unstructured data. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about comparing and contrasting you know, structured data versus unstructured data and the kind of optimizations that you can do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Yeah, so so um, uh, a lot of the uh, big data systems are used to uh, process what starts out as unstructured data. So, for example, text files, uh, you know, representing logs or uh, you know documents from the web or anything like that. But as you process them, you generally tend to add some kind of structure. So you extract some fields from each record, or um, even with something like JSON data, even though technically it can and contain you know all kinds of weird uh, elements in there. Uh, you select some of the fields that you care about, and you do things with them. So as data flows through a pipeline, in, in most places, in Hadoop deployments as well, uh, it becomes more and more structured. So this is where uh, these APIs come in. Now, when you know something uh, about the structure of the data, there are several uh, types of things you can do. So the first thing is in terms of storing it. Uh, there's been a lot of work in, in doing very high performance um, analytical databases. And uh, for example, one of the main things that has come up is uh, column-oriented storage and processing. This is um, similar to uh, basically the um, um, uh, struct of arrays as opposed to array of structs that you sometimes have um, in, in scientific programming. It basically means, you know, if your queries tend to access only a few fields in the record, it's better to store together the same field into one uh, address in memory instead of having to scan through a whole lot of memory and only extract out a small percent of the data. And um, once, you, once you store data by column, you can also compress each column. And there are some algorithms that can um, operate directly on the compressed data to, to do simple things like sums and so on, where you never have to uncompress it, um, which is also kind of neat. Um, and then uh, apart from these um, storage optimization, the, the, the other really big class is uh, kind of algebraic optimization. So when you have a query, like you, you start out with a table and you say, okay, I want to pull out field one and then plus two times field two. And then I want to group by something, uh, you know, and then I want to filter out, where, the, let's say, just the top ten uh, values. Um, you can actually rearrange the expressions the user give you and move them to, to sort of minimize the amount of work. So, for example, if you know that they're filtering out something, you can do the filtering before you do the computation of, of the other values that they want to select. Uh, if you know they're grouping, you know, and then discarding some groups, you can just skip stuff that is not in the correct group uh, at the beginning. Um, and um, these things are, um, you know, basically these are all things you'd have to do by hand uh, if, if you were writing uh, uh, MapReduce, essentially. And um, if you can instead write a structured query or write an expression using data frames, uh, there's a, basically a compiler that comes up with the best query plan for you. So you've been talking about a lot of examples that really do come from the data world. Now, you've been seeing some examples around of actually using Spark for more traditional heavy computation, yeah. iterate on the data many, many times. Do you see Spark being used for that much? And you know, what's, what's your opinion of Spark being used for that sort of work? 
Yeah, we've we've seen a few uh, neat use cases there, and actually, I'm I'm definitely interested in uh, you know in finding uh, more of them and in trying to apply this uh, this kind of technology to to HPC as well. Um, so. Uh, one one set is uh, just heavy um, computation, but uh, on these kind of um, uh, you know these these commodity uh, clusters. So um, as uh, examples of that, um, there's a, a group. Um, um, in uh, neuroscience uh, at the uh, Janilia Farm Institute uh, that's using uh, Spark to process um, data from uh, brain imaging, basically. They have uh, a way to image the brains in, uh, in sort of live animals and to see which neurons are active as they're doing certain things. Um, so, uh, you know, for example, they have this fish and they show it different patterns and uh, they can see which neurons are firing in it. And uh, they get a lot of image data and then they want to do some analysis on it often in close to real time because they're actually running an experiment there. So they want to do things like uh, you know just basic uh, uh, filtering and processing of the images or they want to do things like figure out which neurons are correlated with each other which would include uh, some kind of clustering algorithm or some, some kind of PCA uh, to, to reduce the dimensionality of the data and try to understand it. Um, so this is an application that's using Spark even though it's, it's most uh, you know, it's very CPU intensive. It's still useful to be able to do things interactively or even in a streaming fashion. Um, another area where um, it's being used is for genomic data. So that is closer to uh, sort of big data processing as opposed to big compute. Uh, but there's a team at, uh, at UC Berkeley that's using it for that to, uh, to build, uh, you know, highly parallel um, uh, processing pipelines for that. Um, and then we've also seen it used in, um, uh, in some computationally intensive machine learning. So, um, for example, um, uh, uh, image processing pipelines uh, or things like um, uh, like um, expectation maximization using some uh, more uh, com complicated models that require a lot of compute um, so it, it's not you know it's not going to be a fit for everything that's compute heavy but things that um, you know that don't have um, uh, super fine-grained um, uh, communication patterns it can actually be pretty good for and pretty convenient to use for those now, one of the traditional complaints uh, about some of these additional frameworks, or at least from the perspective of my community, the H HPC community, is they're really looking to extract every cycle possible. And so using mm -hmm. higher level languages uh, tends to be relatively faddish and things like that. And mm -hmm. that's, that's mm -hmm. somewhat changing because uh, the world is, is going to rapid prototyping and you know, if my computation takes a little bit longer, it's still better for me to be able to code it easier with a higher level framework and language and things like that. Where is your community falling on this? Because the languages that you have chosen to export Spark in is Java, Scala, and Python. And those are all very high level things. So what's, what's the trade off? And, uh, you know, how is the valuation of that in the big data and the Spark community in particular? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is definitely a trade-off, although uh, people are working to close the gap uh, as well to let you um, use native code, at least in, in some uh, specific cases in, in Spark and Hadoop applications. Um, I think the, the reason that uh, the big data community uh, started with these fairly high-level languages, uh, uh, namely the ones based on Java, uh, is because uh, there was a lot of experimentation um, and um, a lot of sort of time pressure to, you know, to, to build um, a new algorithm, for example, uh, that you might try out and then you might um, throw away. Um, so these, um, you know, all these projects started from web companies, um, which have, uh, you know, it's it, it's not like the web companies have one algorithm that you know they've known about for ten years and and they just want to run that at the highest throughput possible and it, it will run there for months. So they want to make it very fast. Uh, these these companies are experimenting with new algorithms all the time. Uh, and they also have a lot of ad hoc queries. You know, someone comes in and wants to explore a data set and maybe find out something new. So they valued um, uh, the speed of um, uh, development, uh, you know, over uh, making any specific algorithm very efficient. Um, and that's the same thing, you know, we've seen with Spark. We, we have a lot of people, especially the ones using it for interactive queries that really need the, the high-level uh, language. Now, in terms of, um, you know, 
know, um, uh, closer to sort of bare metal performance, there are two uh, types of things that people have been doing. Um, one is trying to use uh, kernels or libraries on each machine that are optimized, you know, and that are written as optimized code. So, for example, the machine learning library in Spark uses uh, BLAS on each machine, and you can, you know, use your own, like, favorite implementation of that uh, to do linear algebra. So, it's not as good as writing all of your algorithms, uh, you know, in C from the beginning, but at least for a, a lot of them, you get the, the inner loop part can be pretty fast. Um, and the similar thing is for these um, uh, relational queries, the SQL and data frames, uh, actually a lot of um, frameworks now are uh, generating code at runtime based on your SQL query, and then you get, you know, uh, code that's, um, you know, that's, that's optimized to run this query. So I think, uh, I think we will see some, um, you know, some more efforts to let you get this kind of um, performance. Uh, but there's, there is fundamentally this um, uh, trade-off between, you know, people trying to build something, you know, in a few hours or type a query even in a few minutes and see what happens versus people trying to build something that they know, you know, will run for, you know, many weeks or months into the future. We mentioned that, you know, Scala, Python, and Java are things available now, but you've mentioned that some other things have been worked into it. What's, what's the Spark framework itself written in? Is it written in one of those, or is it written in its mm. own thing? Yeah, it's actually written in Scala. So uh, Scala is basically, um, it's a, it's a um, uh, statically typed uh, language on the JVM. You can think of it as sort of a higher level Java. So um, a lot of the stuff has similar uh, performance to what you'd get using Java, basically. Now, just out of curiosity, what's the largest job that you've heard of or, or the largest RRD? Yeah, the, the, um, so the, the largest job that we've seen, um, uh, we've seen, uh, uh, some jobs that, that processed, uh, over a petabyte of data in, in the same job and ran for, uh, I think close to a week. Um, so this was actually, um, at one of the, uh, uh Chinese uh, web companies, um, that, uh, actually I should look up which one. Um, let me, let me just look it up actually, cause I can, I can then give, <laughs> give you the right answer. So, so the largest uh, uh, job we're aware of um, is uh, over one uh, petabyte of data, uh, and this is a job that actually ran for something like a week. Uh, this, uh, this was run at um, Alibaba, uh, the Chinese uh, web company, uh, to do uh, image processing. So they had one petabyte of images that, uh, that they wanted to process. And there are some other uh, web companies that are also processing, uh, you know, around uh, one petabyte of data per day, although not necessarily necessarily in, in the same job um, using Spark. Um, the largest uh, cluster we're aware of uh, is, uh, is about 8,000 nodes. And uh, in terms of uh, in-memory RDDs, um, I'm not sure what the biggest one is there. I, I don't think uh, too many people have, say, a petabyte scale of memory in a cluster. But uh, we've definitely seen jobs with, say, 10 uh, terabytes of memory being used um, uh, with, in one Spark job. So I want to touch on a little bit of the history of this, too. Can you tell us a little bit about what the uh, AMP lab is? Uh, sure. So the AMP lab is a um, research lab at um, UC Berkeley that uh, I was part of, actually, uh, you know, when, when we started Spark. Um, it's um, a kind of... Um, uh, multidisciplinary sort of lab in uh, big data. So it's it's bringing together people from um, uh, distributed systems, databases, uh, and machine learning, uh, and trying to, you know, look at the, the problem together from these perspectives. And it's also, uh, it also has a few people in there doing applications. So for example, the genomics application I talked about, uh, or uh, uh, other uh, applications at UC Berkeley. Uh, so uh, it was a lab of, you know, about 50 50 people where uh, we worked on various systems that tried to do these. And, and um, uh, part of why Spark started is because we saw, for instance, machine learning researchers, you know, trying to run algorithms that didn't work well on MapReduce. And, and we thought we saw that basically as a problem. Okay. Now, as for the future, though, tell us a little bit more about Databricks. 
Yeah, so Databricks uh, is a, a startup company uh, commercializing Spark uh, that uh, began out of the AMP Lab uh, about one and a half years ago. Uh, so I was part of the founding team uh, along with, uh, uh, you know, quite a few other members of, uh, you know, of the research group. And um, we're now, uh, we're, you know, we're basically the, the largest organization uh, contributing to Spark. And we continue to build Spark as an open source uh, project. And then the way we we um, commercialize it is by offering a hosted service on Amazon. So uh, basically, uh, you know, Spark as a service and tools on top to make it very easy uh, to run and manage. Now, you mentioned open source there. That's kind of key. What license is uh, Spark available under? Uh, it's the Apache license, and it's hosted at the Apache uh, Software Foundation. So anyone uh, can um, sort of join and contribute, you know, using this uh, well-defined process that they have there. Now, something I ask all um, projects who uh, have developers in them, uh, pure curiosity question, because there tends to be a lot of passion on, on every <laughs> side of this, is uh, what version control system do you use and uh, why? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we we use Git. Uh, I think we started with Git from the beginning, uh, and um, really, um, you know, I, I I know there are many pros and cons to these. Uh, even within Apache, you know, many <laughs> many people have different opinions, but. Um, uh, for me, a major reason to use it was actually GitHub. Just the interface online for reviewing patches was, you know, pretty nice, pretty convenient to use. And then we also found that a lot of uh, developers were familiar with GitHub, and and they found it easier to contribute to Spark using GitHub. So I think that's that's probably the main reason why uh, why we did that. Okay, so we've talked about everything Spark is. What what are you guys looking at adding into the future? Um, yeah, there's, there's several uh, things uh, uh, in progress now. Actually, it's quite a bit of activity. The, uh, the, the whole community has grown really fast. So now there are many uh, different people working on new libraries and new features for Spark. Um, the biggest um, uh, sort of direction we've been going in, in in the past two years is actually having, uh, you know, building up a really rich uh, standard library on top of the core Spark engine. So when Spark started out, and similar with Map, Reduce and so on. It was just about the programming model, and we said, like, oh, isn't that very exciting that you can write, say, k-means clustering in 30 lines of code or something like that? Like, wow, that's amazing. Before you would have had to build, you know, a whole distributed system. But in practice, nobody wants to write k-means clustering in, in 30 lines of code. They want to call it from a library in one line of code. Um, so we're we're building a bunch of standard libraries on Spark that all operate on RDDs. You know, all of them can share data with each other, but that have a lot of the, you know, most common algorithms for data processing built in and, and optimized uh, for a distributed setting. Um, so we have a machine learning library, a graph processing library, the Spark SQL system uh, for structured data, and also a stream processing library to do things like sliding windows and aggregating data across time. And most of the activity in Spark is in these libraries now adding new algorithms and, uh, you know, new ways to run the existing ones. Um, apart from this, I'd say uh, the other uh, sort of big thing that uh, I think will happen, um, uh, uh, you know, in the next few months is the R interface to Spark. So I don't know, in, in the HPC world, maybe R isn't, um, you know, as popular as, say, Python for data analysis, but definitely in the sort of uh, industrial, like, data analysis space, it's one of the most popular languages. And um, you'll be able to call Spark from R and call the machine learning algorithms and so on on um, you know distributed data sets that you build using R and I think this will again increase the the community of people um, who can use it um, so you know overall um, our goal is is to have you know uh, to, to look at the uh, the tools and, and libraries people are using for data processing on a single machine and try to provide, you know, equally high level or equally convenient ones that can scale out the cluster. So that's what we've been trying to do. Okay. Another question we'd like to ask people with software projects is what is the, the weirdest or the most unexpected use of Spark that you have heard of? Hmm. Yeah, I'll have, have to think about that. Um, hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so when we started the project, uh, one uh, pretty unexpected use, but uh, actually pretty neat in hindsight, uh, was people building uh, web applications, like user-facing web applications that run Spark queries on the back end. So for example, there are uh, a number of um, um, applications for, say, um, advertisers or, um, you know, basically th- these kind of data products where um, uh, an advertiser can go in and look at how well their campaign is doing, and then they can slice and dice the data. So for example, they can say, oh, let me filter it down to one demographic or one uh, uh, region uh, you know, in the world or one time frame. And as they change the filters for the data, the application actually calls Spark on the back end and recomputes a result. And with the in-memory uh, data sets you can set up, you can actually get back these results in you know, half a second or like a few hundred milliseconds. So you can actually have have an interactive web application that's, uh, you know, running these queries over a cluster in the back end. So when I saw those initially, you know, I, I, I definitely had not expected uh, people to use it that way. And, uh, you know, I was very excited about it. And we've tried to do things to make it uh, easier for people to, to build these. Well, thank you very much for your time. Where can people find more information about Spark? Uh, yeah, you can you can uh, you know find out more, download the project at uh, spark.apache.org, and uh, you know I should also say if you want to try it, you don't actually need a cluster. Uh, you can run it on your laptop. There's a local mode that uh, you know works very well and that uh, you know most people use for development. And you just need to have Java on your laptop uh, and also Python if you want to use Python. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. This was great. Yeah, thanks for having me.